Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeff Rose, and I've been working here in Bill Park for about 11 years, uh, looking at archaeology in the area. And so I wanted to talk a little bit today about my research and, and more about big picture issues uh, involved in this research. I think it all goes back to when I was about 12 years old, and the teacher asked us in class, what sets humans aside from everything else in nature? Why are we special? Why are we different than all the other animals? And the question kind of got in my head, and it stuck with me, and I kept wondering. And we never really came up with a good answer in class. And so I kept wondering, and I think this is what got me into prehistoric archaeology, which is what I do. Uh, because it seemed to me that if we can figure out what happened the moment we became human, the moment we started to look like us, talk like us, act like us, and then spread across the world almost overnight, why did that happen? And if we can figure out why that happened, maybe we can say something about the, the human experience here on Earth. So we have learned a heck of a lot in the past 20 years or so about our origins because of the human genome, because of being able to analyze DNA. And I find this observation to be astounding, that if you took a genetic sample from 55 chimpanzees, which are our closest evolutionary cousins, and you looked at those samples, compared them to every human being on Earth, you would find more diversity in those 55 chimpanzees, one bus load, than everybody on the globe. So what does that mean? That means we may be a giant family, but we're not very old, and we're all really closely related. So while we may look different, we may have different skin colors and eye shapes and hair, when you lift up the hood, it's the same part, the same thing. So our species is young. And if you think of it like a tree, a human family tree, think of a palm tree, because that's probably the most appropriate example. We've been around for about 200,000 years, which actually isn't that long in evolutionary terms. And then we come from Africa. The oldest fossils from modern humans have been found in Africa. And the DNA points to Africa as our homeland. But for the first 150,000 years, we didn't do anything. We didn't go anywhere. We didn't act any different than our Neanderthal cousins. Uh, really, we're just simple hunter-gatherers trying to make a living in Africa. And then something happened. About 50,000 years ago, you start seeing these modern human sites in Europe and in Asia. They cross the ocean into Australia. They go into the Arctic. They cross into the New World, into the Americas, like 20,000 years ago. This is like a blink of an eye. And it's really strange. And so, I figure, if we can figure out what that first step out of Africa was all about, we can figure out what makes us human. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that all the answers are going to be in the Arabian Peninsula. Because you can't leave Africa without going to Arabia. It's this natural gateway. So we can learn all kinds of things by, by coming here to Arabia and by investigating what sort of archaeology we find. We can learn who were the humans that left Africa? When did they leave? Which way did they go? What were the conditions when they left? And most importantly, why? What got them moving? Now, the other thing about Arabia that makes it absolutely extraordinary, aside from the geography, is the fact that the environment is all over the place. So, right now, we look at the peninsula, and this is just showing you rainfall. This is current rainfall, you can see most of it is hyper-arid, but then there are areas that are green, there are some areas that are getting a little bit more rainfall. And actually, things have been a lot worse. 20,000 years ago, this is what it would have looked like. All sand dunes, almost no grasslands, no lakes, no rivers, nothing. On the flip side, the opposite happens. 100,000 years ago, Arabia was transformed into a green paradise. All that land in the great room all called the desert would have turned into a rolling grassland with cows. Uh, there's lakes, there's rivers. And I think this really gives a sense of how enticing Arabia would have been at certain points. So maybe this is it. Maybe it was drawing people out uh, because it was such a favorable place to be. Now, here in Salah, we don't have to use your, our imagination. When I talk about green Arabia, probably doesn't seem that strange, because you still get the monsoon. So you still have a little bit of that green that's still coming to, to Salawa. I took this picture 
three, four years ago, right around this time of year. And here we are, we're driving south on the plateau, down over the mountains, and you can see that wall of moisture, that wall of humidity just off in the distance. So this is Arabia, look where Arabia is now. And this next picture, taken 15 minutes later, is Arabia as it once was. That's the mountains of Arabia. That's the green that would have been over the entire peninsula 100,000 years ago. So this, this monsoon, this marif, is an artifact. It's the last vestige of, of Arabia as, as, as this green paradise. And this is why we started working here. And I started in 2002, and then in 2010, we really expanded the project uh, to, to learn more about what's going on. And we chose this spot. This is a cave just above Wadi Garba. So it's about two kilometers from the ocean. So you have access to the to, to seafaring, access to fishing if you're getting resources out of the water. You have lots of fresh water coming through the light. All year round you have access to water. You have stone and face that they'll take tools out of. It tips pretty much every box. Now, take it from me, I study, I study cave men. This is one of the prime pieces of real estate in the entire Arabian Peninsula if you're going to live in a cave. This is the place to do it. So when we started our project, and this is now January 2010, we broke ground here. We were all so excited. I had got a big research brain to start the project and planning this for about a year. And we were convinced all the answers were here. We just had to go down and start take some dirt away and start the, the, the secrets to the human expansion. 20 days later, we reached three meters not one artifact, absolutely nothing, which is bizarre. Usually you find something, even if it's from 100 years ago, you find some pottery. We found nothing. And the look here on my colleague's face, I think, pretty much communicates how we were all feeling at that point. So, all right, well, we'll change tack, and we'll, we'll do some surveys. So we'll look around, we'll look at the mountains, we'll look on the coast, and we'll find somebody on the surface. And you see here all of these, these red uh, diamonds. These are places where we found them. We couldn't find a single archaeological site for the time period we were interested in. And at that point, I was really starting to panic because, let me tell you, as archaeologists, you can't go back after a three month field season having found nothing and then ask for more money to go and find nothing again. So this was really our shot. We had to, we had to make it work. So we decided, let's go up on the plateau. Maybe, just maybe, we'll be able to make a little bit more progress up there and find something a little bit more significant. Now, the plateau is outside the reach of the current monsoon. It's dry, but it hasn't always been dry. And I think this picture really communicates how wet it used to be. This is Wadi Gadu, one of the main wadis up on the plateau. And you just imagine, just put some rainfall, put some water into this river valley. Imagine this as a river. And that's what it would have been like up on the plateau during this period of human expansion. But it's not just water and food that they would have had up there. They also had something else that was incredibly important in the Stone Ages, and that's stone. The right kind of stone. So this is called shirt or flint. And every piece, every one of these brown or black rocks you're looking at has been struck by the human. It's not necessarily a tool. It's the waste that comes off when you make a tool. But what we found when we started digging up on that plateau is the entire thing, 300 kilometers, is covered in this. So we had hit the jackpot, except we still couldn't quite find what we were looking for. So we were finding stone tools from a million years ago, stone tools from 10,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, but nothing from that really critical period of time that, that I was interested in. Now, I have explained something about stone tools. And I say the word stone tool technology, and people usually laugh because it sounds like an oxymoron. But, but actually, there is a lot of complexity to how somebody makes a stone tool. This is the original technology. So you don't just pick up a rock and know what to do with it and say, OK, I'm going to make a spear. You have to be taught. And it's passed on. It's wisdom that goes from generation to generation to generation. So I'm going to make a tool exactly as my father or my mother made it to, and so on and so forth. So when we talk about stone tool technology, we're talking about language, we're talking about something that's culturally transmitted over the generations. 
So I can look at the way somebody makes their stone tool, but I can tell you they're from this part of the world, this however many years ago. So that's what we're doing. We're tracking stone tools across the landscape to find an African stone tool, an African language that would be the signature of the people that left. So now here we are, still in 2010, and I'm still coming up at the end of what I was looking for until the second to last day of the season. And we found one of these. And it had never been found outside of Africa until that day. It's a very specific technology. And it was nothing we were expecting. And we didn't just find one or two. We found hundreds on the first day from one site. And in the last three years, we found over 250 of these sites stretching across the entire plateau. So we're not dealing with one or two stragglers that came out of Africa. We're dealing with a huge population that came to their farm and flourished here for a long time. So, if you want to know about the human expansion, all you have to do is connect the dots. We know, we, we know the answer now. Here are the sites in Dofar. Here are the sites in Africa. That's who we are. We are a people from the Nile Valley. Nothing what archaeologists expected up until we began this research. Up until this point, we had always assumed we are from down here, from Kenya, from Tanzania. We never thought for a minute we might be a nilotic species. But that's the case. And we also know when we left Africa, because the sites in Africa are dated to about 125,000 years ago, about the old sites. And then the sites here in Arabia are dated to 106,000 years ago. So sometime in that window, humans left. And they didn't go north, because we don't find a single site in the Sinai Peninsula. We don't find a single one of these sites anywhere in North Arabia. We find them in Omar. In the last couple of years, they started to find them in Yemen. So we know the route they took. We know that they left when Arabia was green, when Arabia had gone to, to the savanna, to grasslands, uh, when it was a place that could be inhabited. And I think this is the last piece of the puzzle. Now we can say something about the human experience. But it's also a bit of a mystery. We left when it was green. But we didn't go by land. That doesn't make any sense. We, we, we would have expected to see people moving from the Sinai, down, down through Saudi. But we jumped over the water. So why did we jump over the water? Now, this is weird. At the time, Africa was green. People were, they were full. They had plenty of food, plenty of water. There was nothing they needed. Now, humans are lazy in general. We don't like to change. We don't like to go outside of our comfort zone. We don't like to be in strange places. So none of this explains why humans left Africa. And here's what I think the answer is. And I think this is what the defining characteristic of our species is all about. You're standing here on the edge of the Red Sea, looking over at Yemen. So you're standing in Africa, and you're looking at the Arabian Peninsula. I think this is why they left. They were curious. We're the curious species. We want to know things. We see these mountains every day. Imagine an early human standing there on the beach every evening, watching the sunset over yet, watching the sun go behind those mountains and wondering to themselves, what's over there? You're not going to be able to resist that challenge. It's enticing. It's drawing them out. And finally, somebody's going to say, I'm building a raft and I'm going to go look. And I think that's what happened. I think we were so curious, we went to find out what was on the other side. So I would say, this is who we are as a species. We're curious. And that curiosity kept driving us. It brought us to the, cold, to the coldest places on Earth, to the deepest places on Earth, to the most inhospitable environments. That curiosity has caused us to land robots on Mars, to send probes outside the borders of the solar system, By that same logic, if we stop being curious, if we stop exploring, if we stop wondering what's on the other side, then we risk losing the one special thing that makes us human. Thank you for your attention.